We have seven. Okay, awesome. awesome. Thanks. Welcome. Okay. Can you hear Lynch? We can. We can't see you, but we can hear you. There's three. Hi, Lynch. So we are with the farthest reaching schools in the whole ESU. <laughs> so thanks for joining us today. Were you all able to um, access the resources at the website? We don't yeah. have any handouts this time, but just um, our presentation, if you want to go back to it later, is there. Yep, our um, resources are all posted, should be all posted on the website as usual. Um, and you can access those there. And how'd you like our opening slide? Hopefully a little funny for today. So we're gonna focus on um, talking about those basics of reading comprehension um, today. And so, yes, we have some funny little um, teacher memes for you. Um, so uh, we'll let you read those over and think about, is there anything that's funny that has happened to you so far this school year? Because if we can remember those funny times, it makes us get through those hard times. Does anybody have one to share? <coughs> anybody? Anybody want to share a funny story? Or even a success story, a um, win, I guess you could call it. Okay, well, we'll come back at the end and see if anybody has a story they'd like to share about the school year. So again, hi, um, I'm Steph Monick. I'm sure that you're probably used to us by now mm -hmm. and seeing us. I'm staff developer here at ESU8. And I'm Tina Souser, the uh, tech integrationist here at ESU8, and very happy to be back with you today. I'm glad we're not getting any snow today. Although, way out in Stewart, did you guys get some snow last night? You know, they got some yesterday. I was there. We didn't get any last night, but the day before. Oh. You guys had some slippery roads. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> okay. Well, that's the benefit of Zoom, too, that even if we have bad roads, we can still meet. So before we get going, there's just a couple of vocabulary terms I think we should cover um, that will give you a little bit of background for this class today. But the first is reading comprehension. We use that a lot. But actually, do we know um, the, in depth what it means? So um, it's understanding a text by pulling out meaning and building meaning as you work with the text. So I think a lot of times we just say, well, reading comprehension is remembering what you've read, and being able to retell. But it's actually um, being able to form meaning by pulling out that information and um, at the same time, um, you know, build your own meaning or um, being able to um, think back about what you already know about the world and, and form that meaning and as you pick apart the text. Right, and, and just making connections with the text, I think, is the big thing, um, especially in reading comprehension, because if you're not making connections with the text, you're basically just reading the words for the words and not the meaning behind it. And decoding, so we use that word too, and it's kind of the, that teacher jargon, but it's decoding basically is just sounding out a word, uh, using word attack skills to figure out what a word says. And in that, kids, um, little kids especially, have to learn that um, whole process of turning these symbols of letters into a sound. So um, decoding is basically sounding out, figuring out what that word says. Um, so there's a really famous quote from Louisa Motes, who's kind of a reading guru, um, that says, teaching reading is rocket science. And it is a complicated task, and um, we are always learning more about it. Um, 
I don't think that you can ever say that I've learned everything that there is about teaching reading because there's always more research, always more methods, and you know, every brain is just a complicated piece of equipment. And teaching brains to, um, you know, turn those, you know, the pieces of writing into meaning is just a really difficult task. So we're going to touch the tip of the iceberg today, but by <clears throat> no means is it um, a comprehensive look at reading. Right. We're just going to give you a few strategies and, and ideas that you could do, hopefully kind of on the fly, because you guys know, you guys are working with the kids that, um, and, and you're probably full aware that everyone learns differently. And I think that's where some of this teaching is like rocket science because you're constantly having to figure out how your students are actually connecting to the information. So what we're going to do today is just to give you some of those strategies where you could possibly, um, again, do them on the fly with the students so that you can help them make the connections that they need. So what skills and knowledge do make a good reader? So what things do we need to build in our kids and make sure kids can say about themselves? So one thing is um, a good reader must have some word attack skills. They're going to allow the kids to decode those words in text accurately and fluently. So again, they're going to be able to sound out words. Maybe they know their phonics really well. Phonics helps you be able to sound out those words um, better. Um, so, and also, um, it's really important that kids pronounce words correctly. That um, means that they'll be able to use them again when they see them, if they can just pronounce the words. Also, um, kids should have some vocabulary knowledge and oral language skills that help students understand the meaning of words. Um, so, at all of your schools, I think that are on here today, um, Vocabulary is a big focus and has been for the last couple years. And so it's really important that kids understand the meaning. And actually, they've, they've uh, found that vocabulary is one of the largest factors in re reading comprehension. Do they even know these words that they're being asked to read? And there's a, with vocabulary, when I was in elementary, we always, I always focused on the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic movements with vocabulary so that they can make those ties with the definition. So basically, you can um, create a visual that goes along with the vocabulary. Uh, and you, we actually applied a movement with every vocabulary word where it could help those um, uh, kinesthetic learners understand the vocabulary as well. And then, of course, the auditory are hearing and, and hearing and relating to the words based on on the word itself and the definition. So if you can make those connections with them, um, and like I said, just by applying an action and a picture to the vocabulary, it helps them develop a deeper meaning and understanding for the word. And some of those things are more meaningful than um, when I grew up, we used to have to go get dictionaries and look up all these words, and we were reading definitions that were too hard for us to, we weren't ever going to remember them. And so really we've moved away from those dictionary definitions to more of a student-friendly description of the word. And the next one is background knowledge that includes knowledge acquired at school. So background knowledge is so important. Have they had any life experience with the topic that they're reading about? You guys can probably all name a time that kids were totally clueless or lost in the text, and it was because it was about maybe a place they'd never been or a topic they've never heard of. And actually what they've proven is vocabulary instruction is background knowledge. Is, gain, is giving the kids some background knowledge with the word. It's a, um, it's a time that they've used the word before they get to it in the text. So um, we might notice that our rural kids might have less background knowledge than kids um, who maybe go on more trips and, um, and have more experiences within the cities that they live. So that's a, a job for us to really focus on with rural kids. And I think the background knowledge is a huge component of understanding what they're reading because if they take the time to associate themselves with what they're reading, then they're taking the time to actually understand the text and understand the content. And I think a lot of times as teachers or paraeducators, we are in such a hurry to get them the information that we don't allow time for them to really process and to relate to the information. And if you can kind of take a moment and step back and 
and relate the information to something you've experienced, it has a deeper and longer lasting meaning for the students. And then also um, kids, to, uh, to be a good reader, they must have thinking and reasoning skills like drawing inferences. Um, it's not just about what the text is telling you, but it's making those decisions to make inferences too. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go, but kids really need to um, be able to reason and think through things and think about what's the author um, not telling me that I need to just pick up on. And so sometimes, especially kids who might need para support, have a hard time with that one because it's a high level skill. And next, um, they need the motivation to learn and apply the information um, so they can reach that automaticity or when they see a word, they just know it. And I think that that's a big struggle too with our kids. Some of our kids love to read and some of our kids <laughs> just don't. How can we motivate them to be interested in it? So hopefully we're using um, uh, text that, that you know, apply to one of their interests or um, something like that. But we've got to keep them motivated and with that mindset of I can learn, I want to learn more. So these are things now here that uh, a good reader must do. That was things that a good reader must have. And now we're going to focus on things that a good reader must do. So they must draw on that prior knowledge. So we talked about background knowledge. So good readers really pull out experiences that they have had and try to apply them and help them understand what they're reading now. Again, sometimes we have to help kids see that connection because it's, it's something that some kids just don't have. If you don't have any background with something, it's going to be really hard to be able to understand it. And I think, again, that all of these concepts are just making those connections with what you're reading. And, and going back to prior knowledge, they're just able to really um, make the connection with the information in, in each other. So sometimes you might even, um, maybe you're reading a personal reading book with a kid, and it is about, um, I don't know, volcanoes. So a lot of our kids won't have a lot of background knowledge about volcanoes or experience. So you want to ask them some questions that's going to draw that out. Like say, have you ever heard of the mountains? Have you been to Colorado to see a mountain? Do you know what mountains look like? Could you draw one for me? And then say, well, you know, a volcano is just a special kind of mountain. And we're going to read more to, to learn about it. So really, Drawing on that prior knowledge is asking some questions of the kids. Right. And again, starting where they, they are, um, what they have already understand or what they can relate to. So drawing inferences is something else that they must do. And we talked about that a little bit in, a minute ago, too. So it says, in addition to understanding the literal points that the author is making, Good readers are able to read between the lines and draw inferences about a wide range of hidden meanings, such as why events are unfolding like they do, why characters behave in a certain way, or what the characters are thinking and what might happen next. So really drawing that inferences, it's a really high level skill. So um, we sometimes have to help kids with that. I used to tutor and um, we had a kind of a task card about drawing inferences and um, it described inferencing as um, taking something that the author told you, mixing with um, something that you already know about the world and making a decision about what's going on. So our example was uh, the boy took out two slices of bread on one half he spread some peanut butter. On the other half, he put some jelly. He put the two halves together and cut, the, um, cut it in half. What's he doing? Anybody know? Obviously. Come on, this is not a hard guess. Making a PBJ. Yes, he's making a sandwich. Thank you so much. If I had candy, I'd throw it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but did Stephanie um, tell you that? Did I ever say sandwich and telling you what he did? No, right? 
So we really have to make that inference. Now that's a pretty basic example, right? I mean, some other things like we're looking at why do the events unfold as they do or why do characters behave in a certain way? You know, we might talk about Little Red Riding Hood because we all know that story, right? Mm -hmm. And how um, her knees started to shake as she um, got closer to the forest. Well, why would her knees start to shake as she gets closer to the forest? Yeah. Say that again? So one reason why it might be that um, if we asked a student that, they might say, well, she, she got nervous because it's dark in the forest. Or she, um, we knew that she was nervous because her knees were shaking, and that's something that you do when you're nervous. Or um, she, we knew that she was nervous, her knees were shaking, and uh, there's other animals in the forest, and that might make you nervous. Okay, so so never does the author tell us that she's the nervous. Author. Never does the author tell us that that the forest is a dangerous place but we're able to able to figure that out um so basically like drawing inferences i always think about these as the unwritten messages that they're trying to get across um and and again it goes back to that prior knowledge or that background knowledge you knew that when Stephanie was talking about the peanut butter and the jelly, when, that it was a sandwich. But how did you know that? Probably because you've had a sandwich before, because you've made a sandwich before. It's drawing on that prior knowledge. And you, it might even just be prior knowledge of another text. Like, I knew that um, the forests in old fairy tales are usually a dangerous place because I've read other stories about being in the forest. Um, so we can draw on those other books that kids have read, too. And again, it's important to pull those points out for students because they're not going to do this on their own. They're not going to stop and make these types of inferences on their own. And so some of these, these skills, you've got to help them develop as, as, um, as, as they, they begin to learn to read. Especially some of our struggling students. Some of our really good readers might just do this on their own. But some of our kids who have had those less experiences and maybe have read less in their life need help with that. Another thing that good readers must do is self-monitor. In other words, they're going to they're gonna know when they're having trouble and um, kind of stop themselves and ask some questions. So during the reading, good readers learn to monitor their understanding, adjust their reading speed to fit the difficulty of the text, and address any comprehension problems they have. After reading, they check their understanding of what they have read. Students who are good at monitoring their comprehension know when they understand what they're reading and when they don't. So have you guys ever been reading a book and you get down to the end of the page and you ask yourself, what did I just read? Because I do it all the time. <laughs> Either it's really complicated text, and so I need to go back and reread because it was hard for me, or my mind wanders, <laughs> which is probably nine times out of 10. And so I need to go back and reread to just um, comprehend better and pay attention better. And so um, we have to ask kids about this, and sometimes we have to foster this in them. They don't have it going right away. So it might take um, having some questions asked of them to be able to say, hey, did you get that on your own or do you think you need to try it one more time? And I think a lot of times what happens in, um, in learning to read and in our text and the text that students work with is they'll go through the whole reading and then they're asked to comprehend. Then they're asked the questions. And so we kind of need to teach them to stop occasionally within the text to review what they've read thus far and to, to kind of pull out those important points before you get all the way to the end and then you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the chapter mm -hmm. to start again. Um, and, and that happens a lot in um, texts that, that they have 
that they've been reading. And so I know they're trying to change that now and they are doing a better job of that, but we still have to teach those kids that it's okay to stop and go and think about what you've read before you continue the entire chapter or the entire page. I think especially with our older um, learners too. So those of you who work with middle school and high school kids, you see that all the time. Their assignment might be to read chapter six on their own, right? So they're going to just read it from start to finish and not stop along the way. So if we chunk that content, chunk it into a paragraph or a couple paragraphs or maybe a page and then slow down and do something to use that information, it would help us out. So one strategy there is to use sticky notes um, and maybe even take a sticky note for each page, um, especially for kids who have trouble with comprehension. And they have to jot a note about what that page was about. Um, or maybe every few paragraphs, they're gonna jot a note about something in that paragraph. And then those become um, almost a flip book um, to help write a summary. So you can just put together all the sticky notes at the end and they can flip through and tell what they read about. So, uh, sticky notes are a very good resource. And I think. I think that that's a way better idea than having them highlight because okay. myself, and, and I know this happens with a lot of people, is I'll go through and I'll read and I'll highlight a whole bunch of stuff. But does it really relate to what I need to understand from the text usually? No. So if you're pulling out just those important points and writing them down on a sticky note, number one, you're revisiting those points while you write them. And number two, you're coming to the end and you're putting it all together into a, a like Stephanie said, a summary of what they've read. And so then they can go back and relate all of that to their background and prior knowledge. Um, also, we need to help kids form mental images and mental images is what I always tell them. It's the movie going on in your brain or it's the cartoon of what's happening in the story. So if they can kind of picture it like it is a movie or a cartoon, it'll help them. Some kids have a hard time with this and they should draw out little pictures. If they have some um, paper with them they can draw the images and we're going to show you um, a graphic organizer later that might help with forming mental images so I remember once um, one of my teachers in junior high actually told us to draw a picture of the main character of our book and I had it wrong I had not listened to the details of that read aloud book that she was reading us and I had it wrong, but um, I'm definitely a visual learner that every book I've read, I swear I can go back to in my head and see the pictures. That makes a big difference. And another thing that they must do is summarize and retell. And we touched on that a little bit with those sticky notes, but kids have to be able to quickly tell you what happened in a story um, and retell some of those main points. So summarizing requires students to determine what is important in the text and then put it into their own words by retelling verbally or writing. So maybe they're just going to tell you one time what they read or maybe another time they need to write it down. As a kid I was much better to tell you than I was to write it down. Um, writing it down I wrote way too many details. Mm -hmm. So we really have to help kids focus on just the important parts. And instruction and summarizing can help students become more purposeful as they read and more skillful in comprehending. That's because their, their brains are looking for the important parts. So especially when we think about um, a nonfiction text where they're reading a lot of information, um, that's really important and it'll serve them well all the way through college. Yeah, that, that was my point. I mean, think about when your kids get to college, they're reading this informational text and they're going to have to, unless they're going to spend hours upon hours reading a book and deciphering through all of it, they're going to need to be able to summarize and pull out those important points of the text so that they can relate the information to what they're supposed to be learning about the text. And that's really hard for kids to do. Okay, so let's talk about some strategies we have um, to help improve comprehension, especially, I mean, I think as a uh, classroom teacher, I relied on my parents to help kids with comprehension strategies a lot. So um, I think this is um, some ways that you can really help out your kids when reading with them. So one thing is to use graphic organizers. So how many of you already use graphic organizers? 
I guess we're not seeing the screens of everybody, but I'm going to guess that many of you have, and we're going to take a look at some of them here. So graphic organizers help students organize that information and understand the format or text structure better. Um, sometimes just getting it down on paper really helps kids to kind of see that information in an organized way. Um, it takes something that's more abstract, like the reading that's just going on in their head, and it puts it down on paper for them. So, um, and it also helps students write a well-organized summary or text analysis, which maybe mm -hmm. they've been doing for some of their writing pieces. So where they're having to pull evidence out of a piece of, of text to back up their writing. And um, we have a whole bunch of free templates here on this link down here at the bottom. So later you could access this link and um, print off some free templates there. And the one thing about all of this is even though your teacher may not give you that as a template to use with your students, it's something that you could always relate to if you're trying to help students walk through these kind of these strategies and help them um, identify what they've read. And I think some of these graphic organizers are simple enough. Steph mentioned to me earlier about you go ahead and say what well you're I always about. I always want to use graphic organizers that are simple enough for kids to draw on their own later. Um, so there's some really cutesy graphic organizers that have all these like thematic things on it and clip art and stuff like that. And some of them get really complicated yeah. in what you have to organize and I think it's and I'm not saying that those are bad necessarily it's just not what I gravitate to I try to make ones that kids could could draw on their own if they only have a blank sheet of paper in front of them so we know like on Nisa on the well it's not gonna be called Nisa anymore I think we actually got a new name it's called NSCAS or something like that something weird yeah uh, NSCAS or NSCAS um so um uh they can't have any papers with any writing on it, but they can have plenty of plain white scratch paper. So if we teach them to use some graphic organizers that they can reproduce themselves, then they have a tool to use on the test. And if every time we use a graphic organizer, we tell them why we're using it, um, then they'll know which ones to use at which times. So um, I highly encourage these. So the first one I want to talk about is the Venn diagram. I think that this is probably um, one of those graphic organizers that is used the most of any. Um, and it really helps you examine those similarities, similarities and differences um, to do a compare and contrast. And um, you can use it within one text or two or more texts. Oh, I think we need somebody to mute themselves. We might be able to help you with that. There we okay, go. there we go. All right, so I want to show you an example here. One of my favorite books is Ramona Quimby, age eight. And so here um, we're going to look at the differences and similarities between Ramona and her sister Beezus. So Ramona, she's the little sister and she's mischievous. Beezus, on the other hand, she's the big sister. She has more responsibility and independence. But both of them are from the Quimby family and need to help family through a tough time. So this circle part over here is just about Ramona. This over here is just about Beezus. And the center is what they both have in common. So again, these are the contrasting areas on the edges, and the center is the comparison or how they're alike. So that's used a lot, and I mean, I use this all the time for informational texts. You might be comparing and contrasting vertebrates and invertebrates in science class, or you might compare and contrast uh, Nebraska with Florida in social studies class, or you could even, do it sim as simple as you know talking about shapes and, mm -hmm. and things like that and what they have in common similarities and differences mm -hmm. and and how easy of a form can you get is drawing two circles that you can use with your kids and so this is something you guys could do on the fly with a student who if you're trying to pull out some 
um, compare and contrast information. And so then I would always make sure I reiterated to kids is we are doing this so that we see how these two things are alike and how they're different. We are going to compare them and say how they're alike. We're going to contrast them and say how they're different. And it's really important to tell kids why we're doing it. Give them that purpose so that they can use that tool again on their own. Another um, graphic organizer is the chain of events. So here we use this for a series of events. Uh, it helps to write a summary because those things in your boxes can become sentences for your summary. And we really need to focus on only the main important events. And that's why it helps to have those boxes drawn to start with so kids don't put in too many things. Um, but it can be as simple as beginning, middle, end, and just have three in your chain of events. Um, it can have many more than this. If you think about you working with some of your older kids, your um, high school kids here, um, they might need to do this for um, a novel like uh, Romeo and Juliet or, or Huckleberry Finn or something like that where they're, it's gonna be much longer than four boxes. Um, but maybe they wanna do this for each chapter even or maybe one cha each chapter is one box and they can only put a couple sentences in per chapter. Um, for preschool kids, this is something that you would want to make very visual. We talked about kids who have a hard time kind of seeing the story. You can draw pictures for these and make it almost like a cartoon box. Um, and this is really something that I think goes on a lot in preschool and can be valuable. Um, maybe even you have picture cards that show each part of the story and you're reorganizing them. So um, have kids help write them as they're younger and then have them come up with more and more on their own as they get a little bit older. And another graphic organizer that's really helpful is cause and effect. Okay, so on this one, um, it, we're really gonna look in and help kids understand what made something happen, what caused it to happen. And um, you might have a whole series of cause and effect. So there might be four different cause and effect um, boxes for each story. So cause is, of, of course, um, what happened and the effect is why did it happen, okay? What caused the effect to happen? So again, these can be pictures, they can be words. You think about big problems in a story, you know, usually characters uh, encounter a problem and then you can look at what caused that problem. And I think that this sounds to us probably as, a, as adults is something that's pretty concrete, pretty easy to understand. But when you start, I remember doing this with my third grade class and it was, it was, um, it was a very hard for them to lay out those two details. And so I think if you can use this type of graphic organizer with them to help kind of focus in on those important um, points of what they're reading, then it will help them identify that relationship between cause and effect. And like, like I said, it's not as concrete as it sounds like it should be. Mm -hmm. And this is something to use a lot in science class or social studies class too. So um, the cause might be that um, the factory dumped pollution into the river. And the effect is that the river got dirty. And then the new cause is um, that um, the frogs started to die um, and the effect was that, um, that then um, it disturbed the food chain or something like that. So we can keep going on and on and on with cause and effect. And you'll actually find a lot of instances of cause and effect in um, nonfiction texts a lot. So it's, this is a good one to utilize to help with understanding. Okay, so another thing that you can really focus on for um, uh, reading comprehension is student-generated questions. Okay, so we want kids to be asking questions as they read a story, a book, a text, a small piece of text, um, maybe it's something out of their um, science or social studies book. Anything, yeah. So um, we do have a link up here to the top to a great resource that you can click here on this link. 
Um, but one thing we'll talk about is reciprocal teaching. So reciprocal teaching, and you notice that's a link too, is um, when students take turns uh, reteaching each other, and they kind of take on the role of teacher to talk about what they read. So there's a great video on that link. We highly suggest going back to that video at some point and watching it and seeing what that looks like. But especially if you're working with a small group of students um, and maybe you have to read a chapter of text. So you're gonna read a small piece of it and then have um, maybe the students are partnered as partner A, partner B. And you'll say, okay, partner A, now I want you to reteach or tell partner B what the most important parts of our reading were. And then partner B might need to ask one clarifying question and then they move on and they can switch roles the next time. So really taking that back and turning into um, the, the student becomes the teacher. And that's the really the highest form of learning and knowledge is, is that you can actually teach it to someone else. And you could also do that with just you and the student. So your student would, you would just ask your student, now teach me about what you read. What did you just read? What information can you share mm -hmm. with me if I had never learned about this before? What can you tell me about mm -hmm. what you just read? And you then become the student. And, and it's kind of fun with, with the younger kids to tell them that. You become the teacher, I'll be your student. Yes, kids love that thing, um, that kind of thing. Um, okay, next is they might have questions for the author, okay? So after reading this story, what questions do you have? Or if we had Roald Dahl in this room after reading Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, what would you ask them, okay? Or, hey, there's this news article that we're reading in our high school class. And um, we're maybe going to read a New York Times article about something. But um, what questions do you still have about that topic that you might ask this, um, this guy about who he interviewed or something? And for preschool side of things, you might just say, hey, we just read the book The Day the Crayons Quit what question do you still have for one of the crayons you know so this can be used at all levels really okay next um we might have a kwl you might have heard of those again i think they're used a lot kind of like a venn diagram it, it's a type of yep yeah, a graphic organizer as well so a kwl is a chart where we um write down what we know what we want to know and what we learned. Okay, so um, you do this in three stages. So first, before you do any reading, you write down what you already know about a topic. So if this was an elementary example, we might be talking about the four seasons. So kids might say, well, I know that there are four seasons and I know in fall the weather gets colder Winter's the coldest, and spring the flowers bloom again, and summer is warmest. So those might be some facts they know about seasons before they do any reading. Now also before you read, you want to record some questions that you have. And this section can even be done somewhat during the reading. Yeah, before and during, I mm -hmm. think it's a good time for this. Yes, as questions pop up, they can add some. Um, but you can start out with what questions do you even have to start out with? And, and it might be, well, why does weather change? And why do the leaves lose, or why do trees leave the, lose their leaves? And why do flowers bloom in the spring? So those might be some beginning questions that kids have. Then when you're finished reading, you're gonna have that learned section. So it, um, they might have learned that the revolution of the earth causes the seasons. That in summer, we are tilted towards the sun, and in the winter, we are tilted away from the sun. And I think this, the way that I use this a lot too, um, we would go back and look at all the questions that we had and try to discover if we answered all those questions. And obviously, all the questions wouldn't get answered all the time, but it was kind of fun to allow them then time to go back and answer some more of those questions because especially with science, then they were making connections to um, what they had already read and the new knowledge that they were gaining in order to 
to when they were trying to find the answers to the questions that they had that weren't in the text. So it was a great learning experience um, that helped them, like I said, relate to the text that they had already read. I think this isn't um, particularly important on one of those informational readings and nonfiction texts where they're reading lots of facts. Um, and then on the want to know, that's another great place to put your sticky notes. Um, if each kid has to write a question on a sticky note before you start, then when you get to this learned section, you could have each kid go up and take one of the sticky notes, write the answer to it, um, and then rehang them on the learned. So that's another way to just kind of make sure all the questions that you had got answered. Okay, so finger tracking is another really important thing for kids to do when they read. Um, I don't know, uh, several of you are from Reading Mastery Schools and we know that that's really important with that program. And so um, we can talk about it a little, oh, 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 wrong slide, wrong slide. Sorry about that. We're going to go back there a couple slides. Um, so, and finger tracking, um, kids think it's tedious sometimes. Mm -hmm. And some parents think it's tedious and they say, well, we're, our kids are old enough. They don't have to do that anymore. And actually, it's just so tied to brain research. Um, I had a really low reading group one year and um, I found my kids were not pointing to the right word that they were trying to read and they were way ahead and it just, it really was confusing their brains. They were looking at a different word than they were trying to say. Their brain was hearing and seeing something different, you know, and it was silly, silly mistakes that those kids would make. Like they would say the for she, <laughs> or um, they would see the beginning of a word and just guess at what the rest of it was. So it is really important that kids follow along as they read, and you might even do it as adults sometimes. Mm -hmm. Spe especially as we're in complicated text, sometimes it's important for us to do. So um, I would just highly recommend that your kids sit up when they read and that they track when they read, and they're really actually under the right word as it's being read. Um, it just really helps them out. So. Um, as you're with a small group or one-on-one -on -one with a kid, that's something really to remember. And I think sometimes something that goes al along with that is the fact that you can also use some different tools to kind of minimize the text amount that they're seeing. So even covering up some of the extra text, especially when you're dealing with nonfiction text, text in, in younger students. If you can just cover up some of the extra text and allow them then to finger track on just um, a small portion of the text, and then what you can do is, because you have that small portion, you can have them stop and evaluate what they've read right at that small portion before you go on to the next mm -hmm. one. And something as simple as a piece of paper, a note card, um, a ruler, we've used those yeah, before. Just a piece of paper or a note card are almost the best to use there. And I think sometimes younger kids too, who have those tracking issues, um, and, and some, of, some of the ones that you probably see quite often have, when they see a whole group of texts like that, they automatically get overwhelmed and they get anxiety and they're not able to really concentrate on what they're actually reading. So I think along with finger tracking, I think covering up that extra text is also very beneficial for a lot of kids and it helps them focus in on the content that they're reading. And some kids, too, I think that that bridge, um, that about second or third grade, when they're starting to read some chapter books, that can happen, too. They go from Absolutely. these picture books that have just a few words per page to a chapter book that's just full of words, and, oh, my gosh, this is overwhelming. So use a note card and cover up the rest of the page and just go you know, paragraph by paragraph even. And even if you're not sure if that, that's something very simple you can try with your kids, kiddos who are struggling is, is to start out with that right away and see if that helps them. Um, I literally had a third grade student when I was working with them. I said, I sat down to read with him often and he struggled quite a bit on reading. And then one day I just grabbed a note card out of the desk and I covered up half of it. And it was almost like his, he, he just 
took this sigh of relief and was able to really focus on it. And that's all it took. I'm not saying that he read excellent after that, but it did help improve his, his reading fluency. And he would on his own then start grabbing things to cover up the additional text. So I know from experience that that does help and it does work. Yes. So um, I'm just wondering what other questions are out there. So I know that you must have some comprehension questions because it is rocket science. So um, I, why don't you talk at each of your sites a little bit about some questions you still have about reading. And we'll give you just a couple minutes to do that. And then um, we'll have each of you um, unmute one at a time and um, go ahead and ask us. Okay, how about our Butte site? Butte, do you guys want to unmute and tell us any questions that you still have about reading comprehension? No. I think we're pretty good. We get lots of training with reading mastery, but we appreciate what you have to say today. You bet. Do you have any skills or things that you do with students that could help um, some of the other paras? Is there something that, like a go-to that you use with your students? Our classroom teachers pretty much give us the information and then we help the students more one-on-one. -on -one. So we probably do not produce this on our own. And so um, when I was a reading mastery teacher too, I really tried to take some of those choral responses and stuff to reading and use those in science and social studies too. So just remember when you're working with kids, um, you know, you might work with them a lot in reading, transfer those skills right on over to those other content area mm -hmm. classes. It's so valuable for kids. Yep, I think our teachers do that really well here. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, okay, how about Stuart? We can't think of anything right now. Okay. Sorry. Are there any certain times that kids have more problems understanding what they're reading than others? But sometimes just the more naive ones that are already getting the extra help, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know? Yes, so um, repeating it in different ways can often help mm -hmm. them a lot. And, um, and I think use of those graphic organizers and things can really help them kind of put it all down and see, see the information. Okay. okay, how about everybody out there in Lynch? So you are what? Where Lynch? At? Lynch, do you guys have any lingering questions about comprehension? Um, or strategies you want to share? I think we're good. Okay. Okay, I see Jane listed here. Jane Freudenberg. Any for you? Okay, I have one listed just as admin here. Okay. 
Any other sites with questions? Okay, all right. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. And if you would, um, again, just want to remind you that our resources are here on this parasite. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounded funny. Parasite. Yeah. <laughs> Parasite. hate site. Um, and again, the. Oh, this. Right. Sorry. Um, underneath the resources will be down here underneath November. And the recorded video will be over here. So if you want to direct other pairs there that weren't able to join us today. Um, and then again, if we go back to our main site here, our next one is going to be on behavior supports. Um, Helping kids mm -hmm. with self-monitoring and impulse control. No kids have yep. trouble with that, especially in December, <laughs> right? No impulse control issues. Nah. Kind of ends up, excuse me, kind of ends up being a good good time for to cover that. So, um, and and remember, you can get all of our resources and stuff from our web page. So. We have a report today that some of our emails were going into your like spam folder. So, if you haven't gotten some from us, that could be where they are. You might need to check your junk mail um, or spam. I, we should be offended, right? That emails <laughs> thinking that we're junk and spam, but. Um, anyway, um, hopefully you're getting our emails. If you're not and want them, um, make sure that you just um, email us and let us know. Um, but we're so happy to have you being part of this program this year. And um, thanks for your time and uh, attention today. Yes, thanks for joining us. Have a good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bye, everyone. <laughs>